behind and what we're going to take with us into the new year. Let us pray. Father God, we're on the cusp of a new year, a new decade, and you're wanting us to evaluate, to hear your word, and to make choices and decisions that will enable 2020 to be the best year it possibly can be. And so we pray for your guidance now, your spirit speaking, in Jesus' name, amen. Some of you will be, have been thinking the last few days, it's New Year's coming up soon. I need to make some New Year's resolutions. And you're wondering, what sort of resolutions do I need to make? And if you're just thinking about that at all, I'd like to keep your ears open for the next half hour or so. Hopefully, there will be something from the Word of God that will inspire and encourage us. Friends, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we talk about this book as being the revelation of God. We talk about loving the book because God reveals himself as a God of love through it. But do we really love its message that much to be bothered to listen to it, to read it and to hear it regularly? I know for some of us, we're tempted just to dip into a cherry-picked verse from time to time, a verse that gives us a little bit of encouragement, and we're not too worried that the verse is totally taken out of context. It's a verse that just encourages us. And that is what the New Testament describes as, as the milk of the word. You know, when we're young, when we're new in Christ, that's what we need to do. But I'd like to challenge you to go deeper, to get to the serious food of what it means to be a Christian, to get down to the solid food. And I would suggest that if you've got any time, or you can create some time over the next few days, to actually read a whole book of the Bible. Okay, it might be a little bit challenging to read the whole of Isaiah or Jeremiah, though they'll take you quite a few hours. But there are plenty of shorter books. And when you read the whole thing, it's so different from reading just one or two little verses and having a quick prayer and getting on with the day. I can speak from experience. This week, it was Christmas morning, family had not arrived, and the family that was here was in bed. And so I said to Karen, you know, can I go off for a jog this morning? And some of you know that you know, it's one of those things I like to do sometimes, not because I must do it because it was muddy out there and it wasn't the best sort of weather. It's dark and dingy and over. But actually on Christmas Day, what was the weather like? It was beautiful and sunny, wasn't it? And I put my earphones in and I managed to listen to the most of the Gospel of Mark. I'm going through the Bible. And, and I must say, just listening to Mark was so different from sitting down and reading it. Now, we're all different. Some of you would think listening would be the last thing you'd want to do. Um, you know, reading is, is your thing. But and I'm an auditory person. And what I found was that as I listened, certain verses and ideas and approaches just sprang out to me that kept me thinking and kept me wondering, you know, how is it that I've neglected this gospel for so long? Because we tend to like to go to Matthew or to Luke because they have the more extensive stories about Jesus, more of the parables. They have the stories of Jesus' birth. Or if you want to get into a bit of theology, we'll go to the Gospel of John and, and, and oh, we'll get blown away from that. And Mark, being a shorter gospel, tends to be overlooked. And I must confess that I have done that in the past. But as I was listening to the passage, I found something unusual taking place. That the way that John was writing, sorry, the way that Mark was writing, was really, really gripping. Because, you see, Mark, 
He wanted to write in such a way that he would just include the most important events in Jesus' life. So you don't go to Mark to find a lot of the, the parables, a lot of the stories that Jesus gave. You don't go to Mark to find anything about the birth of Jesus and so on. Mark is written with a purpose. And as I listened, I heard Mark talking about the Jesus who suffered and the Jesus who calls us to follow in his footsteps and to suffer along with him. Thanks, Shirley Ann, for reading that scripture reading this morning. I'll be using the New King James, which you know, modernizes or, should I say, and explains some of the wording just a little bit different. So feel free, free to go with me on that. But what I've discovered is that any book needs to be understood by the context of who it was written to. So, who was the book of Mark written to? We're not absolutely sure. But we suspect that it might have been written to the Christians in Rome during the time of Nero's persecution, during the 60s, in the, uh, in the first century AD. Now, can you imagine being a Christian at that time? You'd heard this wonderful story about Jesus who died and rose from the dead and promised us eternal life and, and you heard all the promises of the Old Testament and you, and you were absolutely positive that being a Christian was going to be the best thing in the world and then along comes Nero and says, time for a bit of persecution. And, no, and, and persecution isn't just a matter of getting a bad message on your phone saying, I don't like you, all right? Persecution was the sort of thing that was life-threatening. People were rounded up simply because they were Christians and would not deny that Jesus was Lord. And they were taken off to prison and they were taken into the amphitheater, the Colosseum, and they suffered for believing that Jesus is God. And so, as I was listening to this book, what hit me was that this book seems to be about the triumph of sacrifice. What it means to be a real follower of Jesus is to suffer as Jesus suffered for us. Now, if you're beginning to say, mm, what relevance does that have to me, Pastor? I'm living in a very comfortable time. Okay, I know there's Brexit coming up and a bit of uncertainty there, but I've got a good job and a nice roof over my head, a house, and, uh, and I've got a nice family, and people love me, and it's a great church I belong to, and I've got a mission and purpose in life. You know, what relevance does this gospel have for me? Jesus said, whoever desires as it says in the New King James. Whoever desires. You know what that means? You know, there is a your longing in our hearts for something bigger and better than all that our normal routine of life can offer. Is that right? You know, we are not satisfied with the world as it is. We know there is something deeper, something more meaningful. We know there is something eternal that God is trying to break through to us and to say, this is your purpose in life. And Jesus says, whoever desires, and he's talking to his disciples, people like you, people who are trying to follow Jesus. Those who may already be following him, because it says there was a couple of groups, you know, that, that, these 12 disciples plus the larger group of disciples, they were all there. And, and Jesus says, if you desire, if you desire. We desire so many things. Not only do we take for granted the basics of life that we have, but especially around Christmas time and in the sales. There is this idea that you need to have better clothes. 
You need to spend more money on shoes. You need to have better household appliances. You need to have a bigger house. You need to have a larger TV screen. And boy, what a bargain they throw at us to make sure that we're tempted to trash the old, add it to the tip, add to the CO2 emissions and decide we need a more powerful car, a newer, better, whatever it is. We are sucked into the consumer culture around us. And what does Jesus say? If you desire, yes, we're people of desires. But what desires are they? And how are we going to respond to them? He says, if you desire to come after me, let him deny himself. What does it mean to deny yourself? Now, what that means is going to be different for wherever you are at in your Christian life. If you're a brand new Christian, if you're someone who is deciding it's time to commit to God for the first time, there is going to be a mass of junk in your life that needs to be cleared out. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to convict us. And we need to let God challenge our thoughts and our sinful practices. And with God's help, we need to ask him to put those things out of our lives. And that work of putting away sin, in one sense, is the never-ceasing work of what it means to be a Christian. However, I want to go into this text a bit deeper because I've been really challenged by it. Because I was asking myself the question, what does this really mean to me? And so what is it that Jesus is saying that we have to overcome? What is it that Jesus says that we have to lay down when we take up the cross and follow him? How do we overcome? How do we deny ourselves? I used to think that the biggest and best way that I could deny myself would be to say, well, what are the things I enjoy? And I've got to put away those things that I enjoy because, uh, because you know, really, I want to be a self-sacrificing Christian. And I need to put away as many materialistic things as I can. And I used to wonder, perhaps this text is saying that if we are going to deny ourselves, then we should become a little bit like a hermit who has the absolute basics of life. And I don't know whether you've ever been to see where the hermits live. And, and, and sometimes the places where they live, they were out in the middle of the wilderness and there was nobody around. And so how do they survive and how do they get enough water? And, 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 and these hermits would, would dig themselves little channels down the sides of hills in order that the occasional bit of water that came would be gathered together so they'd have something to drink so they wouldn't die out there in the wilderness. Is God calling us to simply give up? To give up stuff that we enjoy? To give up the pleasures of life? To become what you'd call an ascetic, that is, someone who denies himself and the pleasures of life. Or could this text mean, when it says that we have to deny himself, could it mean that we have to hate our bodies or our minds, the ones that we have been given? Isn't that what Paul says in Romans 7? And that we have this sinful flesh, and he cries out to God, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And so perhaps it is this hurting, this denial of our flesh that this text is talking about. So let's explore this a little bit more. Because these are all ideas that, that we have to grapple with when we're trying to find out what it means to be a real follower of Jesus. In verse, if you go over the chapter, um, when it says deny yourself, 
I was struck when I was reading, if you go to chapter 9, that Jesus elaborates what could be seen as denial, self-denial. In verse 43, He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell with a fire that shall never be quenched. Wow. Isn't that a pretty serious text? Is that what Jesus means when, when he says deny yourself? Is actually to physically cut off your hand? Or... In verse 45, it says, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. And go down a couple of verses to verse 47. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. What does it mean to deny yourself? There are some people who've taken this verse very literally. One of the early Christians called Origen who lived about 200 years after the life of Christ. He is said to have emasculated himself for the gospel, following a literal interpretation of Matthew 19, verse 12, following along from the same principle of cutting off whatever hurts you. And, and Jesus says there, there are eunuchs who've made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So what is it? Is it that God wants us to lose our limbs? And some of you will be saying, but pastor, pastor, everybody knows this isn't supposed to be taken literally. But there is a part of us that says, can we ever give up enough to follow God? Another approach to self-denial could be found in the way that we should keep Sabbath. Have you ever remembered that the Sabbath is a day that we should, should keep as the most holy day of all? And therefore, we are the most Christian on our Sabbath days in the things we do and the things we don't do. In Isaiah 58, in verse 13, it says in the King James Version, it says, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day. And that word, we must deny ourselves pleasure on the Sabbath, seems to feed into this idea of cutting off bits of limbs and, and, and basically living an ascetic life until you read in other translations that the King James Version probably is not the most accurate on that. And other verses and other ways of interpreting it says that when the Isaiah says that we should refrain from doing our own pleasure, what it really means is we should refrain from doing our own business, from doing as we please on the Sabbath day i.e. going around, making money, doing all the things that we do on the other days of the week. An anything goes attitude is what we have to sacrifice. So, is pleasure okay? If that verse doesn't say that we shouldn't have pleasure, then is pleasure all right? Or is it something that we should flee from? I believe that God has created in us the ability to enjoy and to have really good pleasures. I hope that you've had a pleasurable Christmas time. The simple pleasure of sitting around a table with family or friends on those that you love is a very profound experience. And we reach out in our grace and remember those who don't have the blessing of family at that time. And that's why at places like the Advent Center, there's the Advent Shelter going on at the moment. And lots of Adventists gave up their, their, their special Christmas day and went down to help homeless people have a really good special meal and to make them part of family. You see, 
I believe that pleasure is a good thing if it's done in the right way. Because God put into us a desire to experience pleasure and to avoid pain. We have these so-called happiness hormones that course through our stream. And when something good happens, we feel good. One of the most popular of these is endorphins, and there's a couple of those, dopamine and serotonin. And, and for those of you who study these, these neurotransmitters, they, they, they're given to us for a purpose. So that when we have a nice meal, we say, oh, that was good. That's a little bit of dopamine saying, hmm, that was nice. I'd like to do that again. Or when we go for a walk in nature and we see the sunshine and we see the beauty of the world around us, a bit of dopamine is released in us that says, wow, wasn't that good? Doesn't that feel good? These are legitimate, holy pleasures. And they come from the hormones that God has put into us. Dopamine is associated with pleasurable sensations, along with learning, memory, motor system function, and much, much more. I mentioned about serotonin. It's an, another hormone, a neurotransmitter. And it helps regulate your mood, as well as your sleep, appetite, digestion, learning ability, and memory, and so much more. These things are far more complicated than we've got time to talk about today. But the good news is that God has put these systems in you to be able to enjoy life and to enjoy God's creation and to enjoy God's gifts. Medical experts tell us that there are healthy pleasures. And these healthy pleasures are needed for our mental and physical well-being. A good chat over a hot drink with a friend is something that you enjoy doing, I hope. It is a pleasurable experience because it connects us and builds us up. When we do something to make a nice meal for someone else, forgive the food theme, but it has been Christmas week, all right? You know, there is a tremendous pleasure in providing for the family, isn't there? Isn't that something? And, and you mothers, don't keep it just to yourselves. Let some of the others in your family allow them to learn about the pleasure of, of feeding and preparing and, and getting the compliments at the end. Yes. And for those of you who've had children around over Christmas, isn't there a tremendous pleasure in seeing them open their presents and to enjoy the gifts that you have thoughtfully prepared for them? And then to play with the children as they're exploring and discovering. As you enjoy family, these are the healthy pleasures. So what is this cutting off that Jesus talks about in Mark 9? What is this cutting off? We know that it's not meant to be taken literally. Anyone with any sense would say, well, it's just a, a figure of speech. But some of us are uncomfortable with just dismissing things as saying, oh, that's not relevant for me. If I've got to give up some pleasures, I must sacrifice, and I want to follow the Bible, and I want to follow what Ellen White says that I should do more strictly. And this is God's plan for me. And perhaps this is what I'm going to try to do in 2020. Perhaps I've got to become more willing to give up some of the unhealthy pleasures that I have. Or perhaps I should hate some of the things that make me do some of those things that hurt other people more. But as I was studying about this passage, I found a commentary, it's actually the Andrew Study Bible commentary, that says that when Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 8, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It is saying simply 
that at its core is a call to cease to make oneself the center and object of one's thoughts and actions. So when it comes to those cutting off things, and legs and feet and throwing away your eyes and so on, what that's really talking about is the desire in us that says, I want to become holy by sacrificing things. As if we can make ourselves better in the eyes of God. The problem with that way of thinking, Jesus says, is that it's all about me. It's all about prioritizing what I think is important and my attitudes and my way of doing things. Now, it may be, as I said earlier, that if we're at an early stage in our Christian life where the Holy Spirit is really convicting us that there's some particular battle that we're having with sin, yes, of course, we've got to confront it and overcome it and, and give it up like an aesthetic would. But the challenge of this passage to me seems to be saying that it's so easy to cut off our noses to spite the face. You know that expression? You know what it means? It's an expression that describes the needlessly self-destructive overreaction to a problem. All right? So we want to be holy. Let's hurt ourselves in order to become more holy. And of course, we all know that cutting off your nose to spite your face ends up by being self-destructive. It doesn't help anyone else, but we think we're doing the right thing. And for Christians, we've often thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Another metaphor, another illustration that says that, that it's so easy to get carried away with doing a bit of a good thing that we forgot and forget what the whole point is of being a self-sacrificing Christian. God wants us to cut things out of our lives that God has convicted through his Holy Spirit that he wants us to get rid of. We mustn't simply go for the first thing that comes into our minds and say, that's it. I know what it is, because if we're not careful, we might easily cut off our nose in spite of our faces. When we are evaluating the list of things that's coming into our minds, we have to separate between what the Holy Spirit is teaching us, this is your priority, and what my culture, my background, my sinful propensities are trying to lead me towards. Do you get what I mean? So different things will be different for different people. It's so easy for us to go for the easy things. And as Adventists, we know that we can try and make ourselves more holy by doing some of the important things, like keeping the Sabbath properly. And so we tick off, if I haven't worked from sunset Friday to sunset Sabbath, and then, boy, yep doing one more thing that is right. I've cut out work on Sabbath out of my schedule. You know, I'm getting more holy. Or perhaps when it comes to food, now there's a whole can of worms, and forgive the um, inappropriate illustration, but you know, th there's a whole challenge when it comes to food because for some of us, it's bad enough just to give up pork yeah. because that's the way you were brought up and that's really temptation, tempting. And so praise the Lord when you overcome that. But then what else is there? that tempts us towards an unhealthy lifestyle. And what happens is that when we start just thinking about these things that we should give up, we are tempted to forget that it's not about this stuff that God is most concerned. He is most concerned about our hearts and our attitudes in our battle to try to do those little things that make us look better and feel better as Christians. Because, wow, you know, and I can say as a, as a, perhaps a backslidden vegan, 
you know, that, that, yeah, food can be tempting, all right? Especially over Christmas time. We've all got goals that we're trying to reach. But God wants us to do something better. And the big action is to look at our attitudes. So when Jesus says, cut off your hand or your foot, he's using what we call hyperbole. He's using exaggeration to make a point. And we use that all the time. I used to think it was uh, almost sinful to use hyperbole until I realized, actually, when someone says, ah, oh, this weighs a ton, I'm not lying, am I? You know, I'm just saying this is really heavy. Everybody knows that this isn't physically a ton, 100 kilograms, well, no, 1,000 kilograms, all right? Is that right? Okay. We've got to interpret language a little bit more flexibly. And so when Jesus paints a dramatically serious picture of a pious follower following Jesus with just one eye and one hand and one foot, hobbling along with a crutch, it's creating a picture in our minds, isn't it? that says, don't go down that stupid road, okay? To think that you can cut off bits of you to try to fix yourself. Don't even try to begin to fix yourself. That's right. You'll end up as a disabled Christian thinking yourself a humble martyr for having given up something that you liked. I believe that what Jesus is telling us in both Luke 8 and Luke 9, uh, sorry, Mark 8 and Mark 9, is we should stop focusing on ourselves and become wholly according to the standards of ourselves or those around us. We should deny that instinct that wants to impress. We should deny any attitude that tears others down and demoralizes other people by putting others in their place and telling them off. Instead, Jesus says, what should we do? Take up your cross and follow Jesus. The cross in Roman times was embarrassing and humiliating. The Romans usually made the criminals carry those crosses on their own backs as they were going to the place of, of torture and of death. And as they carried that cross, it was a sign to everyone watching, who's in charge here? The Romans are in charge. They have power and dominion, and they are making sure that this prisoner is a living demonstration in the last few hours of his life that Rome is in charge. And so when we're coming to Jesus, and he says to take up our cross, it's a sign to say, we have swapped the Lord of our lives from all the expectations that others have and that the world has. And we are going to go for God's expectations alone. We are submitting to our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ because he has got the best in mind for us. So what does submission in 2020 invite us to do? First of all, and I've got about seven or eight points here. First of all, it's about putting Jesus first, about loving and following him. Not putting me and my guilt and my problematic life and my failures first. It's about looking at Jesus. That's why the Gospels are so exciting to read. Because it reminds you, not just of what you need to do, but of the Jesus who can help you do what you want to do and need to do. The Jesus who is so dramatically different. The second point. If there is known sin in our lives... Breaking the Ten Commandments in deed, or as Jesus said, even in thought. If the Spirit is convicting you that you have been doing something seriously wrong in the last year, and there's something you need to put away, whether it's a physical action or a mental attitude, confess it and repent and ask God for the strength to turn around because we can't do it by ourselves. If there is someone that we are coveting, if there is somebody that we have stolen from, whether it's 
something physical or whether it's a reputation, whether we have dismissed somebody and put somebody down. We need to confess. Perhaps we might even need to go to that individual and say sorry. Because true repentance is not simply a matter of going to God and saying, God, you forgive all my sins. Praise God, I'm a forgiven sinner. And there's a whole string of people along the road, along the year that you trashed and hurt and are still suffering. And you think that, okay, I'm all right. No. When we come and are submitted to God, we recognize sin, its destructiveness, and are willing to ask forgiveness. Third thing, we need to remember Jesus' summary of the law. And so when the Ten Commandments and all the other laws of the Old Testament are held up before us and we say, yeah, that's what we can do, we have to remember what Jesus said was the focus of the law. Remember when he was asked, what is the most important thing to do? To love God and to love our neighbors, to love others. And, and so if there is anything that we do in our lives that is not totally loving God or totally being willing to love our neighbors, whether in the church or outside of the church, then that perhaps needs to be cut off. The fourth thing we need to do is to look at our attitudes. What's our pride like? at the moment. We know the truth. We've been blessed to have a wonderful, truth-filled set of messages that we've been commissioned as the Seventh-day Adventist Church to share to the world. And if we know the truth, it is so easy to think, hmm, I've got it right, and all those people out there have got it wrong. And we end up by just feeling smug and we're tempted to pride. Another major temptation in our attitude is towards a critical spirit. It's very easy to criticize other people, especially people who are trying to do something. They might be failing, but it's so easy to criticize, isn't it? If I were doing it, if I had done that, you know, I wouldn't do that. And of course, the truth is that every one of us needs encouragement. And before we point the finger of criticism, we need to be able to ask the question, what is happening in that person's life? How can I understand the burdens that are on their shoulders? How can I come alongside and support you rather than condemn you? Another one of the attitudes that we might have to cut off is the self-justification. You know the way that we just like to think of ourselves as having the best way and the right way of doing things. Or when somebody does come along and approach us and say, look, Bernie, I'm afraid that uh, you know, when you said this, you did that, you know, I don't think that was the best. And there is a program inside here that immediately goes to self-justification. Oh, you don't understand what my real motive was this. And you misunderstood me. And we try to justify ourselves, don't we? Isn't that the first thing we do when we're, when we're criticized? That instinct to self-justification prevents us listening to the Holy Spirit who may be speaking through our friend, who lovingly tries to help us to grow. Another attitude that's we may be struggling with is apathy. I can only do so much. And I've done my bit. And it's time for me to put up my feet and let other people carry on. Now, I know that God doesn't want us to be workaholics to the point we kill ourselves, all right? So it's not being apathetic to have some relaxation and some rest and, and, and to enjoy the beauties of the world that God has given us because that gives us balance. But when we notice that the apathy starts coming out, it could be that we've been hurt badly. 
and we're giving up. But we need to challenge that. There's many, many more attitudes that we have that might need cutting off. One that affects many people as they grow on in their Christian life is the whole attitude of cynicism. You, know, you dismiss the good by saying, oh, all they're doing that for is because they want to be seen to be better than other people. And we start to devalue the good works of those that are around us. Those attitudes are a challenge. What else does God call us to do when he says to, be, to submit and to take up our cross? One of the biggest ones is generosity. Generosity with our time, with our resources, and with our finances. As you're going into 2020, it's worth evaluating how you have been spending your money, how you've been filling your time. Have you been working so hard that you don't have time to help others and to bless the church? Have you been so focused on saving up or paying for whatever needs to be paid for that you're tempted to keep back the tithes and the offerings that God has called us to share with his people? Another area of sacrifice is to do with the willingness to serve. Am I willing to do the hard thing? The seventh one is when Jesus says, we have to take up the cross and follow me. Implicit with taking up the cross means this is the road of suffering. This is not an easy road that I've called you to. God says, this road, the Christian discipleship pathway, inevitably is going to be painful. It was painful for Jesus as he walked along the Via Dolorosa, the road of suffering. And there will be times when it will be painful for you to carry the cross of being a follower of Jesus. If you're not suffering... It might be because you're treating the whole thing too lightly. That you're not willing to shoulder the responsibility of carrying the cross and following Jesus. It might be that one of the New Year's resolutions for you is not to think about, shall I give up chocolate for the New Year? Or whatever else it is that's going through your mind. But something much, much deeper. What about my attitudes? Am I suffering shy? Do I run away from the call to take up the cross? And the final one, in case you're feeling a little bit burdened down by all of these, uh, these responses to what submission might mean. The Christian road is also, I believe, a road of rejoicing. And for those of us who are committed to the Oh, isn't Christianity hard life? There is a balance to it. What does it say in Isaiah? But those who wait upon God shall get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and they don't get tired. They walk and they don't lag behind. All right, in a, in a, in a modern version. What it's saying is that, yes, Taking up the cross sounds like it's a pretty heavy, tough thing to do. But what happens is that when we're filled with the Spirit of God, God lifts us up to a place where we're actually flying with him. The suffering doesn't become an old, oh, terrible me thing. It's about how can I take on the challenges of what God wants to change in me and in my life and be the person that becomes an example, an encouragement, and a support for those that are in my life. So, as we round up, what is God convicting you to prioritize this year? I doubt it. 
that it's that whole list of eight things and the subcategories within them. But perhaps there is something that God's Spirit has been saying to you this morning. Yes, I need to reprioritize. Yes, there is this thing I need to do. 2020 is one of those special years that marks the beginning of a new decade. I know in one sense it's no different, but that's the way we do things here. We mark things off. And what I want to do is as we start this new year, is to commit ourselves and to invite ourselves to commit to God. And this is the last Sabbath where we have the old church officers in place. And for those of you who were at the beginning of the service, um, I gave a testimony of thanks and appreciation to people who've given an awful lot this year. Many of you will never know how much others have given in this last year to help to make this church continue and to thrive. It does require sacrifice. But what I'd like us to do now is to invite our new church leaders to step up and to stand up as we have a prayer of dedication for all of those who are taking part in one way or another in the life of our church. Service is never straightforward, but I am deeply, deeply glad that God has called us and that many of you have said they are willing to step up to that responsibility. A church would not exist if it wasn't for people saying yes to the invitation from the nominating committee to take a role. I know lots of people are away today. But what I'd like to do is, as we conclude, is to have a special prayer of commitment, first for our church officers, and then for everyone who wants to make a new commitment for the coming year. So if your name has been read out in the last few weeks, as someone who is going to be a leader in any capacity, a helper, supporter, um, your name might be on a list of uh, the sheets. I, I don't know whether there's any spare ones that we've got. You'll pick one up on the way out, perhaps, of the officers for this coming year. I'd like you to stand right now. But I knew church officers stand. And all of those who are taking part in any way who have accepted the, the call of, of service That's great to see our young people involved as well. It's, uh, it's lovely to see. Now, for those of you who are still sitting down, um, some of you are, are regular visitors here. Others are taking a break for whatever reason. But we believe that God is wanting to use you in a special way this coming year. And we want to commit to you, to God, and to following him. So let's bow our heads as we pray, shall we? Father God, we've been talking about what it means to, to sacrifice today. And to be a leader, to be a team member, to give up some of our precious time for the sake of your family, your community, your church, is a challenge. But we thank you that all of these people have stood up because they're willing to try. We're far from perfect, and we wish we had far more gifts than what we have and far more time than what we've been allocated, but we have what we have. And I want to ask that these and all the other church officers that have been appointed for this coming year be filled with your presence and your power, that we will turn this church around with the strength that you give us, that we will seek you on our knees and that we will become the church that you want us to be. And for those of you who'd like to make a recommitment to God at the end of this sermon, a recommitment to serve God in the new year, I'd like you to stand up. For those of you who want to prioritize taking up the cross, and following Jesus. 
for whatever it means, and it means so many different things to different people. We pray that you will accept the commitment of those who are standing and those who are sitting, who are making a conviction and committal in their own hearts. You can read what's happening, Lord. We thank you for them. And we ask that that commitment will not be just a, a passing phase, just another New Year's resolution to be broken, but a commitment to put you and you alone first in our lives, to follow you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, to love you till the day we die, or until you come back. And that's what we're hoping for this decade. Strengthen us all. And bless us, Father, as we commit to serving you and one another. In Jesus' name, amen.